In the last session, we looked at the prologue of the Gospel of Mark, including the ministry of John the Baptist, the baptism and temptation of Jesus, and the opening of his public ministry. In this session, we want to look at the early ministry of Jesus in Galilee as he goes out among the people. His popularity is on the rise, and greater and greater crowds begin to follow. There are six sections or units in this particular section of the Gospel. One of the first things that Jesus does is gather a small group around him. With this group, he enters the synagogue at Capernaum to drive out an unclean spirit from a possessed man. From the synagogue, Jesus moves to the home of Peter, where Peter's mother-in-law lies ill. Jesus cures her. This is followed by a section summarizing what has just happened and looking forward to what is coming. From Capernaum, Jesus goes out, and expanding the ministry of healing and driving out demons. The section ends with the healing of a leper. Jesus begins his ministry with action, action derived from his battle with Satan in the temptation. Here he takes on the forces of evil spirits and illness head on and shows us that just as he had power over Satan, he has power over these manifestations of Satan's grip on the Immediately after announcing the theme of his ministry and the demand for his followers to make radical changes in their lives in 114 to 15, the narrative moves to a narrative of two encounters, each with two fishermen. The scene takes place along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, a primary workplace for Galilean fishermen. Jesus walks along the shore of the sea and catches sight of Simon and Andrew. Mark tells us that they are brothers. They're hard at work casting their nets. Jesus interrupts this work and gives them the invitation, come after me. Duto opisomu in Greek. Oh God, here's that Greek again. The prepositional phrase translated after me, opisomu, is a technical term for being a disciple. So in offering the invitation, as it is phrased, Jesus is inviting Simon and Andrew to become his disciples. The invitation is accompanied by a statement, I will make you fishers of human beings. Simon and Andrew are presented with a choice. They have to decide whether they will leave their former way of life as a fisherman to embrace the new way of life offered by Jesus, being fishers of human beings. Their response, in typical Markan style, is immediate. They set aside their nets and follow Jesus. They have decided to embrace the kingdom. They, are more, they more than likely do not know what that decision will entail for them. What they do know is that they have decided to leave their most probably lucrative fishing trade and walk out into the unknown following this minute Jesus. Here we see the Sea of Galilee at sunrise. The sea is a relatively small body of water measuring 14 miles in length and 7 miles in width. This is the picture of a couple of fishermen out on their boat fishing in the Sea of Galilee. Here we have a Galilean fisherman mending his nets on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Now the boats that are used today are quite modern by first century standards. This picture shows <clears throat> the remains of a first century fishing boat that was discovered at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee in the area of Nofginnesar. Try now to imagine three or four people out on a boat like this in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus walks a bit further and catches sight of two more brothers who were, fisher, who were fishing, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They're repairing their equipment mending their nets in their boat. Jesus offers them the same invitation, and their response is similar <clears throat> to that of Andrew. They left their father Zebedee in the boat and with the hired servants. The response of both of these sets of brothers is shocking to the Markan community. They seemingly are seeing Jesus for the first time. Yet they're drawn to him to the point that they're willing to leave everything and become his disciples. This prepares for the instructions and discipleship that will be given later in the gospel. Mark ends with a simple statement that sums up the whole unit. 
and they followed him. Opiso, uh, they followed him, opiso mu, after him. Note again the technical terms for discipleship. Follow and after him. There are no mistakes. They have become his disciples. The preceding text is what is known as a call narrative. There are several such texts in the biblical literature. We can isolate several characteristics that can be used in, in identifying call narratives. First, the initiative in the narrative comes from God or Jesus. Here it is Jesus who begins the action, seeking out both Peter and Andrew and James and John. Second, the ones called are engaged in their ordinary work, casting nets or repairing nets. Third, the call is in the form of a clear summons to follow, either come after me or follow me. Fourth, the call is to share in the ministry or the activity of the one who is calling. Thus, here they're called to participate in the mission of Jesus, described as being he fishers of human beings. Fifth, the response to the call is immediate and unreflective. They leave their families in occupation and follow without giving it a thought. And finally, responding to the call is not a private matter between the one calling and the one called. Rather, it means joining a developing community. Peter, Andrew, James, and John are now a community of followers of Jesus who share in his ministry. This text gives us a chance to reflect on the times that God or Jesus has called us. What were we doing? How did we respond? How did it change our lives? Again, let's look at the map of the area around the Sea of Galilee. From other texts, we know that Peter and Andrew came from the town of Bethsaida on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. But Peter now lives in the town of Capernaum, which will be known as the center of operations for Jesus' ministry. So the location of the call narrative would probably be along the shores of the Sea of Galilee in this region. Having gathered an initial group of followers, Jesus continues his mission. The next set of units are all situated in the town of Capernaum. Some prefer to refer to this as a day in the mission of Jesus in Capernaum. The first unit on the, is the expulsion of an unclean spirit, which illustrates one of Mark's favorite literary devices, inclusion. In common language, it's known as the Mark and Sandwich technique. As the name implies, it implies placing one text, what we could call the meat, between two parts of another text, what we could call the bread. In this unit, the text concerning the expulsion of an unclean spirit is inserted in between two texts concerning the teaching of Jesus and the people's response to it. We will see this technique used by Mark in several units in his Gospel text see how this sandwich technique works. The locale of the unit in the is in the synagogue in the town of Capernaum. Jesus enters the synagogue and begins to teach. The time is on the Sabbath, which may or may not raise red flags. The reaction to Jesus' teaching is astonishment at, at it because, quote, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. One, Mark 1.22b. Here comes another Greek word. The word for authority is exousia. That's what those squiggles mean, which is a compound of two words. Ex meaning from and usia meaning being. Thus, authoritative teaching is teaching from the depths of one's being. One can spot a good teacher because they're committed to what they teach. They teach from their own experience on the subject, and what they tell you comes from the depths of their being because their subject is a part of them. Someone who checks the teacher's manual the night before and rattles off what it says and has no connection with the material. It's clear that they are not interested, so why should the students be? That's not Jesus. He's involved with what he teaches from the very depths of who he is. He commands with authority and people listen. Now, <clears throat> Mark notes that Jesus' teaching is not like the scribes. 
Well, if you look at the methods used in scribal writings, it's clear that the rabbis teach on the authority of other rabbis. I say this, the rabbi says, because Rabbi Gamaliel has said it, and Rabbi Jonathan has said it, and Rabbi Akiba has said it. Jesus, on the other hand, says it because he says it. This is what the synagogue at Capernaum looks like if you were to travel there today. Actually, it's the remains of a third century synagogue which was built over the ruins of the synagogue of Jesus' day. But the structure is basically the same. In the center between the columns is an area where the general worshippers would be standing, and along the sides there are seats for older members to sit down during services. Not shown, but on an upper level, were there a roof, is a balcony for the women to observe the men below. This final view is looking from the front toward the rear of the first level of the synagogue. The expulsion narrative begins simply with the typical market introduction and immediately, followed by, in their synagogue, there was a man with an unclean spirit. Demons were designated as unclean spirits, so the man can be said to be demon-possessed. Again, it's important to note that unclean in reference to the moral ill or in reference to moral ill or fault rather it is not that which is not holy a dialogue begins between the spirit and jesus <clears throat> the spirit questions jesus recognizing who he is what do you have to do with us jesus of nazareth have you come to destroy us the demon clearly recognizes Jesus as one who has power to put an end to him. He then identifies Jesus. You are the Holy One of God. So far, no one in the Gospel has been able to make so explicit a statement regarding Jesus' identity. Only this demonic creature. Jesus' response to the demon is quick. He rebukes the demon and commands that he be silent and come out of the man, thus freeing him. The verb rebuke is another of those Markan special terms. When Jesus is the subject of the verb, that is, the one who is doing the rebuking, the object, that which is rebuked, is always a form of the demonic. demonic. Here, it is the unclean spirit that is rebuked. In the next unit, the fever of Peter's mother-in-law will be rebuked. In a later text, the wind and the sea will be rebuked. All these are forms and manifestations of the demonic, the power of Satan. The verb be quiet has an interesting sense from the Greek. Literally, it means put a muzzle on yourself. And so the demon is to muzzle himself. So through the power of Jesus, words and Jesus action and Jesus only the demon is expelled and exercised from the man and the man is set free the demon will not leave quietly however he convulses the man he utters a loud cry and finally departs the mention of convulsions leads some to think that what is actually happening here is an epileptic seizure this could be the case based on what we know about that disease. But when you look at the experience from a first century point of view, the man is incapable of controlling his actions and so must be in control of another being, hence an unclean spirit. The onlookers in the synagogue are amazed or astounded. What is this, they ask? The answer shows their amazement at both things they witnessed in the synagogue, Jesus' teaching and his exorcism. They have experienced someone with a totally different kind of teaching, described as with authority, coming from the depths of their being. And they have experienced someone who has power over unclean spirits to the point that the spirits obey him. As a result of what has happened in Capernaum, report spreads rapidly through the entire region of Galilee. It doesn't take much to have Jesus' popularity among the people rise. 
We have an example in the preceding text of the exorcism form. As with the call narrative, the exorcism form has six components. First, there is a meeting between the exorcist and the demon. In this text, the man with the unclean spirit comes to Jesus in the synagogue. Second, there is an attempt of, uh, of the demon to resist divine power. Here, the demon questions Jesus on his power to destroy. Third, a powerful response of the exorcist commanding silence. Here, Jesus commands the demon to be quiet, literally to put a muzzle on himself. Fourth, a command to leave. Here, Jesus commands the demon to come out of the man. Fifth, the departure of the demon. Here, he leaves convulsing and shouting loudly. And finally, the reaction of the onlookers, which is usually amazement and wonder. We see that in the narratives with this, with this form, the fame of Jesus the exorcist becomes told wide, far and wide. From the synagogue, the day continues with Jesus moving to Simon's house with his disciples. The unit is joined to the synagogue narrative by the typical phrase, and immediately, which is not translated many times. This immediacy is a sign of the urgency and rapid progress of Jesus' work. Mark lets the reader know that Peter has a purpose in bringing Jesus to his home. His mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. They immediately tell him about her, Mark 1.30. Jesus approaches the sick woman and takes her hand and raises her up. The word used here, egero, is the same word that will be used to designate Jesus' own resurrection. The result is the fever leaves her, and she is now able to perform the proper tasks of hospitality, waiting on them. The word used here is diakoneo, which refers to a waiting on table, and various other types of service that a hostess or a servant would perform as part of hospitality. In the excavations in Capernaum, archaeologists believe that they have located the home of Peter. This is the picture of a 4th century baptistry that was built on the site of Peter's house. The black basalt rocks at the base of the foundation of the baptistry are thought to be possibly original to the house of Peter. Today, the modern church of St. Peter is built over the house. The story of the cure of Peter's mother-in-law illustrates yet another literary form, the healing narrative. The healing story form also has six characteristics. First, the miracle worker arrives at the home or place where the sick person is located. This is followed by a description of the illness or the problem. This description leads to a request that the miracle worker heal the sick person. That request can be explicit or implicit. <coughs> Next comes the actual healing, which takes place by means of a gesture, a word, or both. The healing actually takes place. And finally, the final characteristic is an acclamation by the onlookers, and this can be coupled with a demonstration that the sick person has been healed. In the narrative of the cure of Simon's mother-in-law, these are there, but in a curt, short, quick manner. Jesus enters the house of Simon. His mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They tell him about her. He takes her hand and raises her up. The fever leaves her. She waits on them. In other narratives, these six steps can be much more detailed, or, or one of the other may not be there at all. The events in the synagogue and the word of the cure of Simon's house, at Simon's house lead many in Capernaum and the surrounding regions to bring their sick and possessed to Jesus. What, is follows, what follows is a summary statement that sums up what has gone before and prepares the way for what is to come. The day in Capernaum comes to an end when the people of the surrounding region bring their ill and those possessed by demons. Note, 
it was an exorcism and a healing that Jesus has just performed. Now many appear wanting the same. Mark exaggerates a bit, saying that the whole city was gathered at the door. Keeping the same parallelism, Jesus cures many and drove out many demons from those brought to him. Mark adds one more detail to the narrative of the expelling of demons that recalls the exorcism in the synagogue. He would not allow the demons to speak because they recognized him or they knew him. This again reminds us that humans cannot get the truth regarding who this Jesus is, but the supernatural and even demonic beings know it very well. These cures and these exorcisms are visible signs that God is active in the lives of God's people. The kingdom is breaking in. There are other aspects of the kingdom. The new teaching and the ability to cure and exercise are not just things that Jesus does. They are dependent on who he is, the one announced as Son of God, by God. So it is necessary for Jesus to maintain his relationship with God through prayer, which he does in the next scene of Mark's Gospel. Giving us the when, the where, and the what, Mark tells us that Jesus rose early, that is, before dawn, that's the when, and goes to a deserted place, the where, where he prayed, the what. The tense of the verb prayed indicates that this prayer was not an isolated incident. Rather, he was in the habit of spending such time alone in prayer. His fledgling followers did not yet understand Jesus' relationship with God and did not wish to leave him in solitude. Simon Peter and the others pursued him. The verb in Greek gives the sense that they hunted him down. The implication is that they are seeking him with a hostile motive. They are not happy that he wishes to be alone, where there is, on their minds, work to be done. They want the wondrous works of healing and exorcisms to continue. This is the first sign of negativity towards Jesus' mission in the Gospel text. The disciples eventually find Jesus and announce that everyone is seeking him. Jesus' response is not what the disciples expected. He realizes that his ministry is not restricted to the environs of the town of Capernaum. He must move on to other parts of Galilee and eventually beyond. He answers Peter, Let us go, <clears throat> that is, expand the ministry to the surrounding villages, that I may also preach there. He then gives the rationale for this expansion. It was for thus that he came, that he has come out. And so the ministry expands through the whole of Galilee. Jesus now preaches, (coughs) drives out demons, and heals in all the synagogues of the area. Mark has provided a summary of all that has preceded, and with the expansion motif provides a hint of what is to come, a truly Markan summary statement. As Jesus travels through Galilee, he and his disciples encounter a leper. His disease is not modern-day leprosy, what we call Hansen's disease, but rather a skin disease, one of many, that was prevalent in the ancient world, which developed over a number of years and was incurable apart from modern drug therapy. This leper, bending on his knee, as a sign of homage, entreats Jesus for a cure. So far in the Gospels, others have informed Jesus of the plight of those requesting healing. Here, for the first time, the person himself requests a cure. If you will, if you are, if you will, you are able to make me clean. Leprosy was seen as a disease that was for all practical purposes incurable. It caused the person who contracted it to be cut off from the general community and become an outcast. However, this leper has such a faith in Jesus that he sees Jesus as able to cure or cleanse him and bring him back into community life. Jesus' response introduces my favorite Greek verb, 
Splunk Nigzomai. It just sounds intriguing. It's translated to have compassion. It refers to an emotion that reaches down to the depths of one's guts, one's splunkna. That emotion can be positive, for example, love, affection, or compassion, or pity. Or it can be negative, for example, hatred, dislike, or anger. This verb is used in several contexts in the Gospel of Mark, the first of which is here. In this text, it is usually translated as having compassion or moved with pity. Jesus has a deep emotional reaction to the request of the leper. This demonstrates his concern for the people he is called to minister to. This deep feeling leads Jesus to grant the request of the leper. He extends his hands, touched him, and says, I will it. Be clean. The action of touching a leper is prohibited by the law and practical common sense because of the possibility of transferring the disease. That touch makes a person ritually unclean. That is, they cannot perform ritual acts without undergoing a purification process delineated in the law. Ironically, this very act, which is so contrary to the law, becomes the very act that heals the leper. This, is not, <clears throat> this does not affect Jesus and is wanting to make the leper clean. Finally, the healing command, be clean, is a passive voice which emphasizes that it is the power of God that affects the cleansing. The effect of Jesus' saying is he was immediately cured as we would expect in the Gospel of Mark. The leprosy left him, and he was made clean. The cure is immediate and complete. The text continues noting that after sternly warning him, he dismissed him immediately. First of all, we see that typical Markan word, immediately. Second, the word translated as sternly warn is embramaomai, which refers to the snorting or the growling of a horse. Now, what does that have to do with warning? It's an expression of indignation brought about by an explosive explosion of breath. And finally, the word used for dismiss is the same word that was used for the spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness to the temptation narrative. Ekbalo, meaning to throw or to cast out. So the translation can be immediately Snorting or growling, Jesus cast him out. It is as though Jesus is treating the man as the disease and not as an individual with the disease. Now Jesus then commands the man to tell no one of this. Rather, he is to do what the law of Leviticus demands for a leper who has been cleansed, to go to the priests and show himself and offer what Moses prescribed. Then the priest will give proof of his cleansing, and he will be reintegrated into society. Thus, the kingdom can bring, out, can bring the outcast back into the community. The cleansed leper, however, does not follow what Jesus asks him to do, his injunction to silence. He goes and speaks publicly about the whole affair. The report of this last wonder of Jesus spread like wildfire through the region. The result was that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. When he did, he would be barraged with people who wanted cures, cleansings, exorcism, teaching, etc. Therefore, he and his disciples remained in the outer regions of the desert, but even that would not stop the people from coming. This section of chapter 1 ends with the note that people kept coming to Jesus from everywhere. The kingdom is breaking in and is being met with an overwhelming approval. This positive response forms the setting for the section which we will look at next time.